This is a familiar image of the Native Americans, wild Indians on horseback, wearing feathers on their heads or animal horns, waving deadly lances, a quiver of arrows flying from one arm, a bow slung over one shoulder, and in this picture, protective shields. This is a picture of Native Americans principally as warriors an image that has been bolstered by scores of Hollywood movies, but it needs severe qualification. For one thing, it was the European that brought the horse to America. The, thus, the mounted warrior was a very late development, about 300 years after the coming of the Spanish to America. For another, the terrain of this picture is grassland, the western Great Plains, if there is truth to this picture at all, it traces to the American West in the late 19th century, three centuries after relentless pressure from the settlers had crowded out the Native Americans to the lands west of the Mississippi. By the last third of the 19th century, they had become ferocious in the defense of their lands, their culture, and their way of life. This Indian, then, the ones pictured here, was very much a creation of the Europeans who colonized and settled North America and forced the Indian into a ferocious defense of what, after all, was his. Welcome to English 3350, a survey of American literature before the Civil War. We're here in Studio 3 at the MD Anderson Library on the main campus of the University of Houston. I'm Barry Wood. And today we're beginning with American literature where it all began, with the Native Americans, those people who were here before the Europeans arrived. 
When Columbus reached the Caribbean islands in 1492, there were an estimated 18 million Native Americans in North and South America. Approximately one-third lived in what is now the continental United States. Hundreds of different tribal groups occupied every square mile of the Americas from the southern tip of, of South America all the way to the northernmost regions of Alaska, the Yukon, Canada's Northwest Territories, Baffin Island, and Greenland. They spoke an estimated 2,000 different languages. There really weren't any empty lands in the Americas at all. The European arrival van in 1492 involved a series of fabrications and delusions, the most obvious of which was that the Europeans discovered a new world. Their attitudes included the idea that land was there for the taking because it was occupied only by primitive savages, that the people were there to be converted to Christianity because they had no religion. They were useful to the explorers and settlers because Europeans could not do all the work and they needed new sources of labor. Today we recognize these attitudes for what they were. Crass materialism, religious bigotry, and cultural bias. And above all, they are ethnocentric, Eurocentric in the extreme. It was a long time before people of European descent gained any true appreciation of the civilization or the culture and the intellectual riches of the Native Americans, and too late in many ways, because by the time it was recognized, much of it was irretrievably lost. In terms of literary culture, we may be in a better position than in most other kinds of culture. Most material culture was destroyed. The Spanish systematically destroyed over 90% of material culture of the Aztecs, and we'll talk about that in a couple of classes, some of the reasons for that uh, widespread destruction. A small remnant, however, of survivors from any tribal group is enough to preserve the literary culture because that's a kind of culture that is carried by memory. And to the extent that, uh, that these uh, literary works were captured in time, it, it has been possible to build a, a sizable canon of um, American, Native American literary culture. Much of it was set down in the 19th century when a few f Europeans finally got interested uh, some 300 years after settlement, or when an enterprising Native American who had been assimilated into uh, Anglo culture learned English, perhaps gone to American schools, even American universities, and then took it upon himself or herself to set down these stories uh, in English. And of course the Native Americans continue today. We have uh, in the United States about two and a half, that's by the last census, about two and a half million Native Americans in North and South America, there are still 600 Native American languages spoken by 18 million people, enough to continue a Native American literary tradition, preserving what is there and adding to it. And let me note that uh, I'm using the term here American to cover North and South America because, after all, that's the way the term America was originally applied. It was applied by a, a German geographer, uh, and uh, the Americas were named after Amerigo Vespucci, a, an explorer who first touched South America, and, and it was his name that was applied to the Americas. And after all, there was no nation as we know it which we call America 
until 1776. So America generally applied to the whole Western Hemisphere and needs to be considered, in a sense, as a kind of uh, a total culture in this period before. There are many ways one can justify the study of the Native Americans. A simple way, and a rather startling, in fact, is by sheer numbers. The English began settling in 1606 at Jamestown. There were six million Native Americans in the continental United States. For how long did they outnumber the colonizers? The official census shows that the population of, that the American population of European descent passed the six million mark about 18 Thus, for the first 200 years, that is from 1606 to 1805, more than half the time the English have been in North America, they were outnumbered by Native Americans. And note the date, 1805. That's 30 years after the Declaration of Independence the Native American population was still greater than the population of European descent. Thus, in order to balance things out, in order to give Native Americans the credit their numbers warrant, we're going to trace their literature and culture through this course alongside the literature and culture of those people of European descent. We're going to trace their origins as well as the origins of Anglo-Americans. We're going to try to begin by placing the Europeans in a more accurate context. They were not discoverers of a new world. They were not people bringing civilization for the first time to a new world. More accurately, they were immigrants. They were the first immigrants to a country that had been long settled. Immigrants to a world already well populated with an ancient culture and a rich literary tradition. Immigrants for who for two full centuries were outnumbered by the indigenous people on the continent. They were also immigrants who rarely saw and almost never understood that the people who preceded them in America indeed had a civilization. What occurred then was that Native American civilization, which was rapidly advancing when the Europeans arrived, was arrested. And it is a civilization interrupted in midstream, stopped dead in its tracks, never able to complete its development. Well, a good question. How long were the Native Americans here before the Europeans? I've taken this quote, quotation from the introduction to the anthology on this course. Most ethnographers today call the people who were here at the time of the Spanish exploration and settlement Native Americans, for the migrations of these peoples antedated the arrival of the Spanish in the 15th century. Indeed, the migrations of these peoples antedated the settlement of Indo-European speakers in Western America. I mean, sorry, Western Europe. The forerunners of the Native American population probably arrived 30,000 years ago. If we measure our presence from Columbus's landing in 1492, that's 505 years ago, against the presence of humans in America 30,000 years ago, we find that Europeans and their descendants have occupied these lands less than 2% of the time that it has been occupied by humans. And we mean here modern man. Homo sapiens sapiens, to be terribly precise in anthropological terms. 
The humans who migrated here before us were of our own species. They were not primordial or primitive, not stooped or ape-like, not shambling. They were modern human beings who looked like modern American Indians look today. With them they brought the skills of fire making 30,000 years ago, flint chipping, they were social humans capable of cooperative hunting that could bring down a woolly mammoth the size of a modern elephant. They were survivalists capable of traveling and surviving on the glaciers in the most hostile environment on earth. And from that point on, their advancement was independent of anything occurring in the old world. The story of Native American migration to North America begins probably 40,000 years ago. But it's worth going back into an earlier human past just to trace the roots all the way back to see how these people are connected to us in the beginning, to see our common origins, and to clarify a very complex human past. Keep in mind that we're ultimately interested in how that migration from Asia to uh, Siberia occurred. Fossil evidence tells us that the earliest hominids arose in East Africa. The oldest hominid site based on fossils dates to 5 million BP, which is the terminology for before present. At Laetali in Tanzania, we've got evidence going back 3,700,000 years. In South Africa, we've got fossil remains going back three million years. And these are only three of the most prominent sites in the area of human origins in East Africa. And these were human beings who already showed ability with their hands. They were already using stones as weapons and sticks. And so they are called Homo habilis which might translate most conveniently as handyman. This first species occupied that area, at least based on fossil evidence, for about four million years. Never migrated out of Africa. About a million and a half years ago, another species replaced him, known today as Homo erectus or erect man. And this map of his spread covers the period from 1.6 million years ago to about 300,000 years ago. He emerged in the same area of East Africa. And in fact, the earliest fossil evidence we have for Homo erectus is in that area, clearly indicating that that's where he arose, going back to about 1.6 million years before the present. But soon we find him on the move. Sites suggest that he was migrating out of Africa about a million years ago. In Algeria, for instance, uh, up in this region, we have fossils dating to about 700,000 years ago. In Italy, we have the same, fossils dating to about 700,000 years ago. We find his migration routes apparently moved then across southern Asia, where there are prominent sites in India, and all across into China. And the most recent sites are the furthest north in China, about where Peking is, or Beijing is today, 450,000 years ago. We also find him having migrated down the Malay Peninsula into Java with fossils, again, about the same age. Note the lanes of migration. 
uh, principally the warm regions of southern Asia. Keep in mind that this core area, there's the equator, is, is in the equator. And while there is some migration up into southern Europe, it is in the warmest parts of southern Europe. And the tendency in these eastern migrations appears to be as far south as, as possible. As, uh, and, and it appears by the dates that he occupied these regions for about 800,000 years. Uh, Homo erectus was a hunter and gatherer. He depended on an easily gathered food supply. There is no evidence that he ever ventured out of these areas, no fossil evidence, whatever. Uh, he avoided, of course, desert areas like the Sahara, which would not provide anything for hunting and gathering. He avoided the colder regions of Europe, and certainly if you, if you know your geography, you know that this whole area in here is the Himalaya Mountains, and north of this, in the central uh, Russia, it's very hostile desert country. So these are areas that he simply wouldn't, wouldn't head into because he was a hunter and gatherer. No sites for Homo erectus have been found north of about 45 degrees latitude. But we do know, we do know that he was already a user of fire. In that uh, Chikudian cave up here in the Beijing area, we've got fire hearths and charred bones uh, dated by the carbon-14, which is method uh, which, and, and other methods of dating too that, uh, that indicate that he was, that, that these uh, remnants of bones go back to about 450,000 years ago. Uh, so he was clearly cooking uh, meat by that time and the bones uh, are from giant sheep, horses, buffalo and, and deer. Following Homo erectus, we have Homo sapiens. He appears to have arisen about 300,000 years ago. Again, he, he appears in this core area of East Africa, the oldest fossil evidence of, of Homo sapiens is from this core area of East Africa. This seems to have been the brewing spot. About 100,000 years ago, we find him on the move. And a site, for instance, like this in Israel, dating to 92,000 years ago, tells us that he was migrating out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. There are, and of course, across the northern part of Africa, across into, into Spain and the Iberian Peninsula, and across Europe, uh, numerous sites across southern southern Europe. We see him also migrating along the same routes of southern Asia and up into, into China. And the dates, starting, they're, they're the oldest here in East Africa, but as you move out at distance from that, you find the dates are closer and closer to the present. Now notice, what's drawn on this map is the area, that dotted line that runs across there, is the area of migration of Homo erectus. You'll notice that Homo sapiens pushes further. In, in Europe, he pushes a little further up into the colder regions, north of the Black Sea, a little further up into uh, what is, I suppose, European Russia today. And over here in China, he, he pushes up north of uh, the Beijing area up into uh, further region, regions of, of Asia, which are today Russia. And we've got dates of about 40,000 years before present uh, indicated here. Not on the map is the fact that he also made the leap about this time to Australia. Um, it, is, it is clear that he is stopped, however, by the existence of huge glaciers at that time, which uh, covered all of northern Europe and northern Asia. If you look carefully, you'll see that only the bottom of England is pointing out from under that glacier. Its center was over Norway. It expanded out uh, to, to come down, uh, covering 
all but the tip of England, most of all the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Northern Germany, Poland, a lot of Russia, all the way down to Moscow, and, and right over into the Siberian region. And uh, of course, that turned all of Europe into a tundra region, a very different climate. So migration could not go about that point. Now the fossil evidence tells us that about 40,000 years ago, only one species of man remained. The earlier species had died out, and modern Homo sapiens remains roughly in that extended area within the dotted line. Uh, Homo sapiens, or what is uh, in English, man the wise, or wise man, showing evidence of uh, advanced mental uh, capacity and ability. 40,000 years ago he was the maker of some 60 kinds of stone tools. Formerly in tropical regions, his dark skin provided necessary protection against blazing sun, but in the north dark skin had a, became a liability, screening out essential vitamin D, Thus, those born with a, sh a shade lighter had the advantage for survival in the areas of limited sunlight. And so progressively you find the skin lightening as these people migrate north. And of course, keep in mind that we, we're talking about a migration here that occurs out of Africa 100,000 years ago. And you're talking about a 60,000 uh, year period from 100,000 to 40,000 years ago. To, to keep this in perspective, keep in mind the Christian era is just 2,000 years. We're talking about a migration from Africa to these limits that's 60,000 years. The evidence tells us that human, humans were using animal skins as protection against the weather 40,000 years ago, but the evidence also tells us that humans had not learned to make clothes that would allow them to venture into wintry lands of the far north for any period of time. Uh, there is some evidence of seasonal movement, perhaps movement uh, of a few miles, a hundred miles north in the uh, European and Asian region in summer and then south in the winter, but those glaciers across the northern part of Europe and Asia were severe restrictions on movement into the north. Human clothes at that point, 40,000 years ago, were probably no more than shawl or poncho-like coverings slung over the shoulders, hung from shoulders and waist, certainly not enough to protect against freezing temperatures of the north. Any female today discovers, I think, very quickly that the skirt is not an adequate protection if you're in, let's say, Minneapolis with a wind chill factor of, you know, zero or 20 below. Uh, that kind of clothing, which is basically hung from the waist or hung from the shoulders, just doesn't provide uh, adequate protection. About 35,000 years ago, all of this seemed to change. Fossil remains tell us that Homo sapiens was now hunting along the very edge of the northern Asian glaciers, hunting in freezing or sub-freezing temperatures, and we know how he was able to accomplish this. Of course, he had fire, which would heat a well-made shelter, perhaps a cave. There are lots of, most of the excavation sites have been caves, uh, but well-made shelters, too, of, of branches and animal skins. But man on the glacier, at the edge of the glacier, needed something more in order to move outdoors without freezing. And it's a very simple little device. The crucial invention was this, the needle. Needles made from slivers of bone, highly polished and drilled with a tiny hole. And the occurrence of that invention about 35,000 years ago, turning up with 
in, in human habitation sites tells us that Homo sapiens was now able to sew hides together to produce what anthropologists describe as skin-tailored clothing. Clothing cut and sewn to fit the shape of the human body. And the sudden occurrence of human remains, fossil remains, dating to 35,000 years ago with the occurrence of this particular technological development in Siberia makes the connection very clear that this was the technological breakthrough that, that really made the difference. To hunt and even live for extended periods of time in freezing or sub-freezing weather, of course, requires something more than clothes simply hung from the shoulders or the waist. These people were hunters of big game. It is clear from the animal remains, uh, the charred bones and so on, uh, connected with these various sites. These were, uh, these were species uh, of, of animals particularly suited to cold northern lands. They, they preferred uh, cold northern lands and these people were hunters. Uh, the woolly mammoth was, was one of these animals, the saber-toothed tiger, huge bison, uh, many of these animals now extinct. And so humans somewhere around 35,000 years ago began to venture into the coldest regions of northern Europe and Asia, equipped with efficient hunting tools, skin-tailored clothing, and the ability to build and heat dwellings. And it is from these people that we get the migratory hunters who formed the first immigrants to America. Now, to understand this, we need to understand also the broad geographical changes that were occurring in the last million years, known as the Pleistocene era characterized by four massive glaciations, the so-called ice ages. Our concern here is only with the last of these ice ages, which lasted for well over 100,000 years, and thus covers the entire period when Homo sapiens was migrating out of Africa. And it continued until relatively recent times. So these early Siberian people were hunting along the edges of the same glaciers that covered the entire Arctic Ocean and most of North America. Some facts about the Wisconsin glaciation. Beginning about 120,000 years ago, with periods of warming and cooling, the maximum glacial coverage actually occurred quite recently, about 18 thousand years ago. That's when the last glacier started to melt back. And it had melted back in North America to above the borders of Canada about 10,000 years ago. Glaciers start simply with a lot of snow falling. We've got permanent glaciers in the world today. We have a permanent glacier that covers all of Greenland. It's very simple. Snow falls and it melts in the summer. If all of it doesn't melt in the summer, then you've got some left over the next year when more falls on top. That situation occurs if you get a slight lowering of temperature. Five to ten degrees temperature on the average will make that difference. And so you get a snow buildup. More falling each winter than falls in the summer. An accumulation builds up. Once a thickness of two to three hundred feet is reached, the bottom layers compress to ice and with a thickness of, of several hundreds of feet, you get a glacier that actually starts to move. Here's one in Alaska. And you can actually see the lines here of its movement coming down a slope out of the mountains. This one terminates in water, hundreds of feet high at its lower edge. So ice actually 
flows. Even though it's, it's solid, the weight in the middle, once it reaches uh, oh, 600 to 1,000 feet, the weight is such that it starts to squeeze at the bottom and spread. At present, the Arctic Ocean is perpetually frozen around the pole. That's obvious because people have traveled to the pole on dog sled, and you know it's an ocean up there. It's frozen. Actually, it's a continuous pack of ice about 1,200 miles across. During the last glaciation, ice spread outwards into the Atlantic and Pacific, affecting fully one-third of the world's oceans. The effect of glaciation over land was even more dramatic. During the period from about 30,000 years ago when the glacier was at its peak until 18,000 years ago when it, it started its meltback, one-third of the Earth's land was locked under ice, averaging a thickness of a mile. From northern Europe as I said, the glaciers spread out, covering most of the northern countries of Europe, Russia all the way to Moscow, uh, all the countries of Norway, Sweden, Finland, the, the, the entire North Sea, England, Denmark, northern Germany, Poland, and Russia. And ice also in glaciers spreading out from Switzerland covered much of Italy and Austria and France. In the Himalayas, glaciers spread out uh, much larger than those mountains are today. In North America, here's the North American situation. The, the, of course, we still have a permanent glacier over Greenland. You can open up your atlas and see how that, what that glacier is. It's 11,000 feet thick gives us a good idea of what glaciers were at one time. You know, when glaciers pile up that much ice, they actually depress the surface of the Earth. We are in, in northern Canada, for instance, the Canadian Shield is rebounding now from the last glacier. It is actually rebounding about 20 centimeters every century from the weight of that ice. It's sort of like a, a, a the skin of an orange, if you depress it, take your finger off, you can see the depression, but as you watch, you'll see the skin of the orange come back to its normal shape. This is what's actually still happening in Europe, and it is, it is from the rate of rebound that the, the original depression can be calculated, uh, and, and we get some estimate of, of just how much ice was there. This was the greatest mass of, of ice at all. It, it actually uh, centered right over Hudson's Bay, where, and, and Hudson's Bay actually marks the center of that depression. That's why we have a bay there. Uh, it's estimated there that the, the thickness of the ice was 16,000 feet, which is about three miles. And the arrows indicate the spread of that, of that glacier. Not only covered all of Greenland that joined up, covered all of the northern Canadian, and of course this ice is joined up then with the ice pack that covers the, the Arctic. It was just one continuous ice sheet all the way from Detroit to Moscow. Uh, this particular glacier uh, spread out and, and came well south of the Canadian border, which you can see drawn across here, covered the entire Great Lakes. Um, pushed down here into North and South Dakota, into Minnesota, Wisconsin, well down into Illinois, Indiana, all of Michigan, parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, all of New York State, all of New England, pushed all the way down roughly to the Ohio River in this region and roughly to the Illinois region in the, here. In fact, those rivers are in those locations because they are originally melt rivers from the glaciers. And the hook over here on the edge uh, of New England, the hook of, of Cape Cod, is in fact a terminal moraine from the Wisconsin glaciation. Over the western mountains, you had another glacier. The, these, of course, are the continuation of the Rocky Mountains in Canada and coming down here into upstate uh, Washington, and here you had a glacier on those mountains that, that also 
spread out and those, those two touched and in warm periods perhaps separated along a, a corridor uh, here. The uh, situation um, that results from, by the way, this glacier was, it's estimated, was moving at about 200 to 400 feet uh, per year at its greatest extent from, from pressure, bulldozing, of course, massive amounts of material from Canada out over into the Midwest and, and the upper states of, of uh, Canada. Now, at the peak of the Wisconsin glaciation, water from the world's oceans was tied up in ice. A total of 17 million cubic miles of water was tied up in glaciers at the peak of the Wisconsin glaciation. That's 30,000 years ago to about 18,000 years ago. That calculates to a sea level worldwide between 300 and 400 feet lower than today. This means that you could walk from France to England. It means you could walk from China to Japan. It means that 21,000 islands in Southeast Asia were part of the mainland. It means that the continental United States shores were extended out as much as 250 miles from where they are today. In other words, all parts of the ocean that are less than about 300 feet below surface today were part of exposed land. And uh, this, of course, um, is, is, is absolutely crucial to the story of these migrations. Let's look here at Northern Asia. Here we have the glacier dating from about 120,000 years ago to 18,000 years ago. Over here we've got Ireland, England, here's the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, and now we come across to Russia. This is the polar view. There's the North Pole. As we move over here to China, we could see drawn on here that 40,000 uh, line where Homo sapiens had reached. And we could see then about 35,000 years ago uh, him migrating into the northern regions coming closer to this glacier. Now as we follow this around, we see that because of all this ice tied up in the glacier, we have land exposed here between Siberia and Alaska. Geographers give names to places that no longer exist. The Bering Sea exists there now, but this particular geographical feature is called Beringia. And it constituted a land bridge from Alaska to Siberia a thousand miles across. And so we can easily see what happened here. Migration across that land bridge in around 35, 30,000 years ago. This whole area was tundra, and interestingly enough, the glaciers were all concentrated on the other side of this, the European here. This uh, glacier over North America came to here, and so this is all tundra, good hunting ground, and these, these people were most likely following big game the woolly mammoths, the bison, the giant sheep, and, and uh, saber-toothed tiger and so on, which were fitted to that. Thus, as we follow this around, we can see the movement into Alaska here, and the peculiar way that the glaciers worked. And by the way, ge geologists and geographers can, can easily tell what's been glaciated. It, a, a bit of knowledge about geology will very quickly tell you the landforms that come from glaciation. So we, we're able to piece together exactly where the glaciers were. Here we have the Cordilleran Glacier over the Rocky Mountains that extended across southern Alaska. We had a small glacier up here in what is now the North Slope, or near the North Slope. 
And interestingly enough, the meeting point of these two glaciers in North America, the Laurentide Glacier and the Cordilleran, was right here. And most uh, geologists now suspect that there was at, at various times in the last in that period from 30,000 years ago to 18,000 years ago an ice free corridor and in fact running right up this this uh, line now into the arctic ocean is the mackenzie river and the evidence is that that was a, a huge melt river as these glaciers were melting back and so what looks on a world map like a very difficult route way up, you know, up into Siberia and then across and then down into Alaska. Looked at on this kind of a map, you realize that, that this is in fact a, a pretty direct route here into North America. And, and so then we have uh, a, a clear route. This, this ice-free corridor actually uh, runs or would have run just east of the Rocky Mountains down through the well uh, uh, across Alaska into the Canadian Yukon down the Mackenzie River through the Canadian province of Alberta and striking the United States about Montana and from there of course spreading out uh, east and west and and uh, south into all parts of the of the uh, North American continent. Was this a one-time occurrence? The best evidence suggests that the Beringia connection existed for thousands of years, probably for 15,000 years at least, and thus uh, migration of small bands could have occurred at many times through this period. Uh, and this, of course, we're talking about a period of 150 to 180 centuries. And in fact, that's what anthropologists now conclude did happen, uh, because the last wave of migration appears to have been about 7,000 years ago. The present people who make up the Eskimos and the Inuit population across Alaska and all the way over to Greenland. The, uh, the climate of the continental United States was at that time, uh, tundra, very Arctic-like, and the, the big game from Asia was hunted then continuously for probably another 20,000 years. The evidence is that these, these uh, animals were dying out uh, around 10,000, 12,000, 10,000 years ago. Um, and of course, human, migrations, human migration must have continued because there was nothing there to really stop it, no, no population pressure to stop migration down into Central America and on into South America. In, in the, nor the North and South America, of course, we have lots and lots of evidence of this migration and dating. We have on Santa Rosa Island, for instance, off the coast of California. This is the only place, of course, off the coast of California where uh, where you'd find any evidence because 200 or 100 miles or so of land is now submerged. So any people that were out there during glacial times, uh, the evidence is now on the sea bottom. But Santa Rosa Island, high and dry, hearth charcoal dating to approximately 28,000 years ago. So when you put together the, the evidence from Siberia of human movements there and the evidence, the first evidence of appearance in North America, it's pretty clear, isn't it, when the migration probably occurred, somewhere around that 30,000 year period. In Brazil, we have rock shelters uh, with remains dating to 25,000 years ago. There's Brazil rock art in uh, protected rock faces dating to between 26 and 22,000 years ago. In Pennsylvania, at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, um, we have evidence of stone tools dating back into the 18,000 year period. And at Saugus, Massachusetts, we've got hearth charcoal and stones also dating back into those early periods, uh, more than 12,000 years ago. So 
it is, um, it's fairly clear when the migrations occurred. And while we don't really have time to go into it, uh, there is other evidence too. Uh, the uh, genetic studies on DNA in, in mitochondria, for instance, uh, where any two human beings can be tested and by DNA overlap can be, you can calculate approximately when they diverge from a common ancestor. Uh, those studies done on American Indians, again, show a date of, of 15,000 to 30,000 years ago. And linguistic reconstruction, too, of the American Indian languages gives approximately the same kind of dating. Well, there's a lot of development to, to talk about. As I've said, for thousands of years, probably 20,000 years, these people remained big game hunters. But because of the meltback of the glaciers, the, the game they hunted went extinct about 10 to 12,000 years ago, and gradually they shifted into more sedentary lifestyles. In, uh, in all, about 36 major species became extinct, partly because of the melting of the glaciers and possibly from overhunting, uh, simply the population pressure of human beings. In any case, uh, starting about 10,000 years ago, we get agriculture developing, and we actually get evidence that corn being planted with um, certain kinds of grass cross-pollinated, and we have over a period of five or 6,000 years, corn cobs growing from about the size of, oh, an inch or so long, actually over a period of time, increasing in size and clearly becoming a major uh, staple of of food. We get evidence of grain selection and collections of seeds and so on in Central America from 8,000 to 5,000 years ago. And of course by the time the Europeans arrived, agriculture had spread throughout North and South America from that central, those central spots in, in Central America. With the development of agriculture we get uh, much more settled ways of, of living rather than wandering nomadic hunters. In Central America, for instance, we get the rise of spectacular civilizations, the Maya with their monumental architecture, comparable to what was being built at the same time in Europe and Asia. They developed not only writing uh, um, along the same lines as, as Egyptian pictographs, but they also developed a calendar very accurate calendar with a 365 day year, a calendar that actually begins about 4,000 years BC, so we can get it some, some fix on when their civilization started. In, in Central America, the Aztecs with cities and monumental architecture. Our interest, of course, is with the Native Americans of North America. Everywhere they, they adapted to local conditions. Here, for instance, we have West Coast structures. These are people that were hunting I mean, and fishing. And here we get the, the kind of way that they developed houses along the edge of water. They hewed planks and so on and raised um, totem poles. In New Mexico, we get the rather spectacular development of, of Pueblo building. Here's, here's, a, here's a rock wall that survives over a thousand years from uh, that era of the Anastasi. We, we get, for instance, the use in canyons in New Mexico of, of uh, shaded rock spots for the developing of, of uh, structures of this kind, Pueblos as they are known. This is an artist's drawing of, of Pueblo Bonito in one of the valleys of uh, one of the canyons. This is a vast, vast uh, society that developed in the Chaco Canyon of, of upper uh, northwest New Mexico. This is an artist's mock-up. This particular structure, the ruins of it are, are still there, had 800 rooms and could house 1,200 people, a kind of a huge apartment complex with religious centers. The round structures uh, are 
apparently based on present Navajo and Hopi practice and so on are probably uh, worship centers. And of course, finally, we come to the Northeast. This is, these are Iroquois houses. And the Iroquois are where we want to focus today. Iroquois social structure, it's very interesting. A grandmother was the head of the family. Her daughters and their husbands lived with her. And in fact, all descendants of that elder woman lived together. They built longhouses. They were roughly 25 to 30 feet wide, anywhere from 80 feet up to 200 feet long. Here we've got a village of longhouses. So the family, the extended family unit was, was the structure here. And uh, these people occupied, here's, here's uh, the, the map that was built by, or that was done by um, Codwallader, Codwallader Colden in his book, The History of the Five Indian Nations in 1727. Uh, let's come in a little closer on that. And there, there's a blow up of, of the Iroquois region right in here. You see the five nations and the, the, the tribes are named across here. Still a little hard to see. so. Let's simplify. There's the Iroquois five tribes uh, occupying. This is this is Pennsylvania down here. This is uh, New York State. The Seneca, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, the Oneida, and the Mohawk. Uh, you can remember their names if you if you look at Scum here. Seneca running from east to uh, west to east in that order. All you have to do is remember that the the tribe with the longest name occupied the center position here. Uh, the Onondaga. In the early times, the Iroquois were the most ferocious of, of the Indians. They preyed on the, the Mohicans to the east of them. They preyed on the Hurons north of them in Canada and numerous other Indian groups in other directions, very ferocious. They captured, they killed, they scalped, they brought back prisoners, they tortured. Uh, just in, incredible uh, viciousness. And they preyed on each other too. They did, however, adopt captives into their own tribe, but um, they certainly had a reputation in their early days for being incredibly ferocious, and they fought a great deal uh, amongst themselves. However, about 1450, they formed a league, which brought an end to all that. And this is what I want to focus on today. To try to demonstrate to you, in this one example, how we are dealing with the Native Americans with a civilization interrupted. Keep in mind, 1450 is several decades before Columbus landed in the Caribbean. So this Iroquois Confederacy was created before any contact with Europe. The date of 1450 is as, best, as well as we can reconstruct. Actually, 1459 is the date that one 19th century scholar places. There's no real way of knowing uh, precisely the date, but it's in around the, the 1450 to 1460 region. They became a league, the, the, the so-called Iroquois League or Iroquois Confederacy. They had a central meeting place on the lands of the middle tribe, the Onondagas. Now, part of your readings for this course is the constitution of the Iroquois Confederacy. Let's look at it and test this against the notion of a civilization interrupted. The first clause of this confederacy establishes that there will be 50 counselors from the tribes never more, never less. Now, just to back up for a minute, in the Iroquois villages, 
Remember, they are built around longhouses, a series of longhouses. Each of those longhouses is headed by a matriarchal family, headed by a woman, an aged woman, and her daughters and their families and all of her descendants. The most powerful of those longhouse families supplied the chiefs for the village. The Senecas had eight chiefs in their village. Uh, that would mean eight longhouses had supplied those chiefs. The Cayugas had ten, the Onondagas had fourteen, and the Oneidas and Mohawks each had nine chiefs. The League was formed by simply saying that in addition to those duties of those chiefs in the tribe itself, those chiefs would also become representatives or counselors to a federation of the five tribes. Two of these positions, of course, would be occupied by Hiawatha and, and Deganawida, who were the original founders of the League. And even though they were dead, they held those positions perpetually for them on the idea that the original founders were there in spirit. Clause 2 to 6, clauses 2 to 6 establish the number of chiefs of each of the five villages, which I've just mentioned, Seneca 8, Cayugas 10, and so on. Clause number 7, the Onondagas are geographically the central tribe, and they will therefore supply the central meeting place on their territory for the League. The Onondagas tribes have symbolic power. They are designated as the fire keepers. Fire, of course, the, the, the council fire is a symbolic entity. These people will all meet once a year in the summer around the council fire. And so the idea of, a, of fire keepers is symbolic. In fact, what they did was they managed the ritual prayers. They opened and closed the council meeting and once a decision was made, they were the official spokesman who ratified and sanctioned what had been passed, and in effect, their word then made it law for the League. <clears throat> Clause number eight defines the structure before the League, how nine chiefs in one tribe will work out problems. These nine chiefs represent three totems, three groups. And the way that they will, will um, come to decisions is that one, two, three of the chiefs representing one totem will sit back and watch while the other six chiefs representing the other two totems discuss the issue. The tortoise and the wolf totem people will discuss. The bears told them the other three chiefs will sit back and watch to make sure that they obey the rules. If they fail to follow the rules, the bears then become mediators between the other two totem groups and uh, watch for errors and explain those errors. Thus the bears function in a sense as referees or perhaps master of ceremonies. Uh, they're like a rules committee, or I suppose in parliamentary procedure, they're the people that ensure that Robert's rules of order are, are used. Any conclusion is thus the product of the tortoises and the wolves discussing following rules maintained by the bears. The end result, the end conclusion thus is, has all nine chiefs agreeing. Clause number nine in the Constitution is a quorum clause, and it says, this, this is, describes the Mohawks, but it applies to all the tribes, that all nine chiefs of the Mohawks must be present before council business can go forward. And of course, we understand the legal implications of that. If you make a decision with only half the people there, then it can be contested later on. So quorums have become basic to all government uh, and, and in business decisions too. Clause number 10 explains how debates will operate with the five tribes. The Onondagas are out because they are the fire keepers. The two outer tribes, the Senecas in the, from the 
west and the Mohawks from the east form one, one debate group. The Cayugas, the two inner tribes, and the, and the Oneidas form another debate group and they're paired for discussion purposes. First the outer tribes, the Senecas and the Mohawks discuss an issue and once they've arrived at a conclusion they pass it on to the Cayugas and the Oneidas and, and if they agree, if all agree, then the matter is referred to the fire keepers, the central tribe, the Onondagas, they sanction it and it is passed in council and thereafter becomes law for the league. Chapter 12 um, does, uh, deals with the issue of a conflict, an irres irresolvable dispute in the four outer tribes. If that occurs, then the Oneidas have their say and become the mediators. They take on this additional function and uh, discuss the issues and then pass the whole thing back to the, 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 the Mohawks and the other tribes for further discussion. Clause number 14 says, in essence, the chiefs have to have permission to speak. No butting in in these discussions. And you can only speak in a low tone. These are rules of behavior. Now compare that to the English Parliament in 1450, or for that matter, in 1950. Or compare it to Parliament in Hong Kong or Taiwan, where people have fist fights on the parliamentary floor. And let me ask you, who was the more civilized? Clause number 15 establishes unanimous agreement required for all chiefs of one side before a matter is passed on to, uh, the, to the other side of the council fire. Chapter, or, or Clause 16 assigns the duty to the Mohawks and the Senecas of appointing a speaker of the council, someone who be, will be the official person who, after the conclusions have been uh, made, will stand up and deliver those to the others. Clause number 17 establishes that the speaker has spe specific duties to open and close the council. These are ritual duties to address the council and to proclaim sanctioned cases, matters passed and, and matters agreed on. Clause 18 establishes that the fire keepers, the Onondaga chiefs, will choose their own speaker. Clause number 20 establishes that each chief is in fact a principal chief, but associated with him he will have a war chief, a vice president, so to speak. During war, if a war arises, the principal chiefs, all 50 of them, step aside and in their place 50 war chiefs take over the council for the duration of the war and they thus become the council during war periods. An interesting division of executive and military responsibility. Each chief, each of the 50 chiefs also has a runner to carry messages. In modern terms, he's an office staff of one. He's the guy who operates the fax machine except that what he has to do is put on his moccasins and perhaps run a couple hundred miles to the next tribe to deliver information. Clause 24 establishes the duties of the Onondaga firekeeper chiefs. Clause 25 is another quorum clause. All the Onondaga chiefs must be present to perform their ritual firekeeper duties. There's no allowance in this system for an empty Congress or an empty Senate when a vote is taken. Everybody has to be there. There is, in other words, take these responsibilities seriously. Clause 26 is about two Seneca chiefs functioning as doorkeepers. Clause 27 is, is about what happens if a chief dies and there is no member of his totem qualified to take his place. There is a procedure for this. And um, this is, 
it's very interesting here, Clause 27 and 28 gets into the power of, of the women. Remember that the longhouse is built on a, a single woman and her descendants. The longhouse has a chief. It is the women who choose the chief. This establishes in Clause 27 and 28 that if a chief on the council doesn't do his duties, is a bad politician, disobeys the rules, talks loudly in meetings, butts in, or doesn't do his proper duties, then his female relatives, his wife, his mother, his grandmother, this is a matriarchy, can remove him from being a chief and appoint another chief. So ultimately what we have here is the women in control of who, which men will run things. This charge, the chief by the way is appointed for life, but he can be discharged for infractions of the rules by his female relatives. And that, uh, that discharge is final. There's no such thing, in other words, as a politician being disgraced and five years later it's gone away and they're back running for office again. No way, not in this society. Clause 29 is a rather mystical section. Uh, the uh, five nations have a surrounding guard which is called Kerry Wehu. This is a kind of spiritual section. Jap uh, uh, section 30 describes the symbol of five arrows bound together and it's a very interesting concept. If you have a bundle of arrows bound together and you take out one arrow, what's going to happen? The binding is suddenly loose. The whole bundle will quickly fall apart. And so uh, the emphasis here is that the Federation to work must have all of these people present. Clause 31 describes the responsibility of keeping the council fire, whether this was uh, literally a fire burning or perpetually burning is unknown, but it was certainly the responsibility of the Onondagas. Well, the Iroquois Federation was a remarkable political alliance. Tribes were already established around the family, around the longhouse, and what, what uh, the League was often called was, was the extended longhouse. The tribal family structure was extended out from the individual tribe to a federation that included all five tribes. And the extended longhouse uh, symbol suggested that the family structure had been extended to include the, the, uh, all of the five um, tribes. They had annual meetings every summer. There was a kind of grand meeting at Onondaga of the 50 chiefs the powerful sense of union and brotherhood, lots of symbolism uh, and uh, gathering around a, a um, central council fire. Had rules for debate, quorum rules, behavior rules, sanction and passage of matters rules, a true consensus form of government. Now keep in mind that this thing this federation, founded in 1450, was 300 years before the American Federation of States. It was several decades before the first European con contact with North America. And it lasted until the Iroquois were defeated in 1776 in the Revolutionary War. It lasted for 317 years. And let me just remind you that our country, since independence, has only been here 221 years. So this was a very enduring league. I think there's evidence just with the Iroquois League, without even mentioning the many other Indian leagues around the country, of, of a real civilization interrupted. This Iroquois League was far in advance of any political system that was operating in Europe at the time it was founded.
In fact, that's why we had to have the democratic revolutions, wasn't it? The American Revolution, the French Revolution, and so on, to, to install some kind of system. Who was the first person to ever suggest that the 13 colonies, 13 American colonies, join to form a union? Who was the first person that ever suggested that? first person ever to suggest it was an Iroquois Indian chief by the name of Kanasatego. In July of 1744, in Philadelphia, speaking to a joint Indian-British assembly, he said the Iroquois found it very difficult to deal with 13 separate administrations. And why didn't they join together and form a federation? And he suggested how it could be done, like we've got, like the Iroquois have got. Benjamin Franklin, famous American from the, 17th, from the 18th century, as a printer became acquainted with Indian policy. He published up their speeches and treaties in his newspaper. He spent time studying Indian cultures. His first diplomatic appointment was as the Pennsylvania Indian Commissioner. He learned about the Iroquois Confederacy. He became a lifelong champion of the Native Americans. In 1754, this is 22 years before the colonies declared independence, Franklin, speaking to the Albany Congress, called on the delegates to the Congress from the 13 colonies to unite and form a union modeled on the Iroquois Confederation. What Franklin saw was that the Iroquois League blended the sovereignty of five nations into one government. And as you know, that is precisely the ideal that is enshrined in the American Constitution of 1787. This is a neglected side of American history. It, that it's neglected is, is clear evidence of long inattention to the advanced civilization of the Indians. Um, it's, it's, uh, federalism certainly was an invention of the Americans. It's always given credit to the Constitution of 1787, but in fact the evidence suggests that while it was more or less patented by the colonists in, in the Constitution of 1787, it was actually invented about 300 years earlier by the Iroquois. Their, their system is, is a federal system. Sovereignty of individual units blended together into one government. And of course, this is, this is exactly uh, what is, is happening with the sovereignty of, of states blended into a single, uh, single federal government. Well, have a good day.